Our brains were not designed to remember everything. That's one of the facts revealed in a new book, Why We Remember, Unlocking Memory's Power to Hold On to What Matters, uh, shares how to better remember the things we don't want to forget. Dr. Charan Ranganath has been doing memory research for more than two decades. And he joins us now. Thanks for being with us. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Wait, I thought, I thought that we're only using like 10% of our brain, and so it was designed to hold a lot of stuff. We're just not able to do it. Uh, that's a widespread belief, but it's also a myth, as it turns out, that actually we're using all of our brains all of the time, and our brains economize by just recording a fraction of what we experience. So most of what we actually live through, we will forget. And it seems, I don't know, when we were growing up, there was a lot of memorization in, in school. And I remember thinking, looking back, it just seemed kind of, kind of useless uh, because like Benjamin Franklin said, I, can, I, I don't need to memorize things I can look up. And yet there we are spending years memorizing stuff that we will never remember. Uh, sorry, I missed that last part of the question. The way we were taught was to memorize everything. Do you say that that's a bad way to go? Well, I don't think memorizing is bad, but what I would say is, is that we don't necessarily use the best ways to memorize. So one of the things that I describe in my book is that testing is actually a great way to help people memorize. Another is to actually study your information that you're trying to memorize as far apart as possible. And unfortunately, we're optimized for cramming, basically, which is why we would study all night before a test. And then the next week, we would have forgotten everything we already tried to memorize. So how do you decide if this is something this is something I really want to remember? How do you get your mind to remember that and have it stand out from the other junk? Well, that's exactly it. You nailed it. You want the event to stand out from all the other junk. So the way that a memory will stick around will be if it somehow grabs you in a way that's different from all your other experiences. So paying attention to the sights and the sounds and the smells that are going on will really help. Another thing that I talk about is planting cues, meaning that if you have something in your environment that serves as a reminder, like in the old days when people used to tie a string around their finger, that kind of reminder can help. So sometimes, if, for instance, if you have to remember to take out the trash or go to a doctor appointment, visualize yourself seeing some reminder in your environment that serves as a trigger and then saying, oh, OK, I've got to take out the trash. Mm. And if you imagine doing it later on when you see that reminder, you'll be able to pull it up. Let me look at it from the other side. We had a guest once that said your brain is like a tape recorder. It records things through your, your life. And I thought science said the complete opposite. So when in court we hear about you know, some, a witness saying, oh, I remember this happened to me 30 years ago. Is that reliable? Does the brain work that way? Or do we have somehow false memories? Well, you know, one thing I say in the book is that I don't necessarily believe in true or false memories. We often remember what happened, but we're very bad at remembering the details of what happened. So we, the context, for instance, is much easier to forget. And so as a result, memories are more like a painting than a video or a photograph. That is, they reflect some parts of what happened, some parts that we imagined and inferred that could be incorrect and some parts that just reflect our beliefs and our imagination and our perspective. And so what I would say is, is that uh, we won't necessarily want to discard everything in eyewitness testimony, but we should be a little skeptical when people don't, uh, that people will remember all the details absolutely correctly, because often that's not the case. Uh, you say you should use mental time travel to retrieve a memory. What is that? Well, there's a form of memory that I specialize in, which is called episodic memory. So this is our memory for events, like the last time I visited Chicago, for instance. And when we recall those memories, there's something about the place and the time that brings back other memories from that same period, which is why psychologists call it mental time travel. And so there's things that can serve as a vehicle for mental time travel, like music is a very powerful one, or being back in a particular place can be very powerful. For instance, for me, it would be being at Northwestern University where I did my graduate work. And so these vehicles are uniquely associated with a time in your life so that when you're in these places or you hear these songs, they bring you back to that time. What is chunking? 
Chunking, the idea behind that is you can memorize, you can remember more by memorizing less. And so the idea is, is that you try to use what you know to reduce what it is that you're trying to hold in mind. Hmm. So everybody's familiar, for instance, with phone numbers having essentially <laughs> uh, 10 digits. And the reason for that is because we group our phone numbers into essentially a chunk of three, a chunk of three, and a chunk of four. So rather than taking up 10 spaces in our memory, it actually only takes up three spaces. Oh. And that's just a pretty simple example, but we can use this in many ways in, in modern life, whether it's like using a song to try to memorize things or attaching a story, for instance. Sounds good. Well, the book is Why We Remember, and you can follow Dr. Ranganath on social media. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you very Thank much. You. I appreciate it.